Welcome to the second renaissance where we decode the rebirth of human creativity in a technology-driven world. In this second season, we explore how sustainability is elevating our human consciousness and catalyzing us to create within constraints. We decipher why now is the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity since the dawn of industrialization and what leaders can do to harness the winds of change. I'm Anders Sormanilsson, global futurist, impact champion and father, and your host for The Second Renaissance. On today's episode of The Second Renaissance, I speak with my Swiss-German futurist colleague, Gerd Leonard. We investigate what is the meaning of the good future, why green is the new digital, the fact that the pandemic was a test run for climate change, and how to redesign capitalism to ensure that it's future fit, and ultimately what the cost of inaction on climate change is. In 2016, Gerd published the book Technology Versus Humanity, a manifesto for digital rights and an investigation into the many areas of life currently impacted by technology disruption without regulation or policy. His open letter to the Partnership on Artificial Intelligence was published in the Wide magazine in October 2016, calling on technology leaders at IBM, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Amazon to embrace digital ethics in the emerging era of cognitive automation. Emphasizing a European tradition of humanist values and philosophy, Gerd pursues a path of technological balance as evidenced in earlier eras such as the Italian Renaissance, which perhaps makes him the perfect guest on the Second Renaissance. Welcome to the show, Gerd. <laughs> Hello, yes, whatever version you want. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Hello. It all works in this virtual world. Great to have you on the uh, Second Renaissance, Gerd. And uh, I was just reminiscing here while we were preambling a little bit that the last time we actually met face-to-face was in a bar or a restaurant at the uh, Gaylord Hotel in, uh, in Dallas, Texas for a um, milestone conference. The world, uh, yeah, the world in 2020 in February uh, was very, very different. Do you recall what we were talking about at the moment, at the time? Was it a little virus that was emerging, perhaps? I, I think it was about the future, <laughs> but not the virus. <laughs> I I, I, re- I recall that we were both sort of reading about it, and uh, I think, um, if I recall correctly, it was probably my last overseas trip, and I had started wearing a mask in February 2020, but it's still, uh, it was still a time when, you know, America had not yet shut its borders with, uh, with China, I believe, and, but this thing was starting to cause a little bit of a nuisance. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, completely different. I mean, in the last two years, it's been just upside down in so many ways, you know, going from the real speaking to the virtual speaking. Uh, I've developed sort of my keynote television format. And I, I realized in the end, you know, I, I like doing things online, but I really do miss meeting actual people face to face. And I'm not really willing to compromise and, and, and just look at the green light for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know? I mean, this has been a you know a consistent theme in in your thought leadership and uh, and your content, your memes, your ideas for a long time. This idea of you know technology versus humanity, or technology and humanity. You, you speak of the 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 new renaissance, which is very aptly named of, of humanity. Uh, and one of your most recent publications is is this idea of of the good future. What what is the good future? Because we all need that story and uh, and. And how do we design it at the moment? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's really important to define what future we want today. Because, you know, many people think about the future and they're saying, okay, what kind of future is coming? Or what future can we have? Uh, And the reality really is that the future is here. uh, The future is made every day. And we can pretty much have any future we want. Uh, You want to upload your brain to the internet? You can probably do that sooner or later. You want to uh, you know, put yourself in cryonics and wake up 200 years, that's already possible. Uh, you know, you want to change your human genome, that's, that's possible, becoming possible, right? So the, the question is not so much about what future we can have, but what future we want. And then when we look at ourselves, it's quite clear we want a good future, right? And a good future, uh, I've talked to hundreds of people about this, 
The bottom line is, you know, we want to be ha able to have certain freedoms. We want family. We want self-realization. We don't want to die. We don't want to starve. You know, that, that's generally good, right? So 98% or so of people uh, define good, a good future as you know, within a pretty narrow range of basic parameters, you know, not talking about how many cars you're going to have or what kind of job you have and stuff, right? And so that's become the focus of my work is to say, well, how do we get a good future? And, and you know, what, what does it need for us? Because, again, I realized that in the end, we do have all the science and the tech, like Buckminster Fuller said. We have all of that, and we're building more every day, right? But we're doing the wrong stuff with it. Uh, it so it's not quite much of a question of having the right tools. We have all of that. We have the money also, as we've seen in COVID, right? But do we have the will? That is the key question. You talk a lot about this idea that the future is really a mindset and, and the, the big question is not whether we have the funds, but do we have the willingness or, or the will to truly embrace uh, a, a new future? Do you want to just expand a little bit or that, on that or give a few examples of where you're not seeing people sort of developing the, a, a future fit model of capitalism, for example, and where, where the big transitions need to happen? Well, it's funny, you know, going, again, going back to Buckminster Fuller, who said that uh, humanity is building all the right tools and technology, but for the wrong reasons. Um, and really what we're seeing now, we're seeing this, this explosion in technology, uh, human genome sequencing, uh, big data, cloud computing, 5G, intelligent assistance, and the story goes on, hundreds of things, right? And, and now with the new vaccine, you know, we have the mRNA te technology, which is probably going to help us to solve other diseases too, right? So we have all that really cool stuff. We have a vaccine in 12 months, but then we completely fail to change the business model of rolling it out to everybody. So in other words, we, we have all the cool tech and the tools, but then we say we'd like $50, or I think, what is it now, 27 per shot, right? Because the pharma industry has patents, right? And we are not willing to change the business model. And so really what has happened ever since nuclear power you know, when uh, we invented the nuclear bomb, is that we were quite uh, aware of its powers, but we did have to have a real incident of damage to get together and to limit the problems, right? And now with COVID, we've had the incident, or we, we're having it, right? And now we're figuring, okay, maybe we have to change some of the rules. For example, temporary foregoing the patterns of the pharma companies, which has been discussed on the global level. And uh, with artificial intelligence, uh, you know, very soon we will have the power to build a machine that's kind of human-like, parenthesis, right? But what are the rules? Right? So I think this is the key point, is that humans are very good at building stuff and, and uh, inventing. Right? Are we good at collaborating? And so far we have been, but only once we do all the things that don't work. Right? And there's a great quote by Winston Churchill who said this about Americans. He said, you can always trust Americans to do the right thing once they tried everything else. And I think it's kind of the same way for humans. You know? We can trust humans generally to do the right thing, but we often first try the wrong things. And, and, and we really do need to change that. You know? Like we, we learned from the pandemic, but next it's about AI, it's about human genome progr uh, programming and, and programming humans. And you know, we do have to think about what do we want and how much of that do we agree on that is good or not good, right? That is the key question. Yeah, and of course, for all our uh, American viewers and listeners, I mean, uh, it's been said that America is not necessarily a, a nation in the traditional sense, but rather, you know, an idea and uh, certainly a collection of, you know, the the major nationalities and, and cultures that are all around the world. So maybe maybe the statement from Churchill is is accurate for, 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 for all of humanity as well. Um, so that is, you know, that's the good future. It's it's a different future, and that's one that we're, you know, designing very deliberately and mindfully, intentionally. What have we learned during the pandemic? Have we become better humans? Are we learning how to collaborate? I mean, you say uh, in some of your presentations and 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 during your GERD talks that COVID nineteen and the pandemic, in many ways, was a test run for the climate agenda that we're now having to, to really double down on. Um, have you got any more thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so I, you know, I think it's when we look at the COVID crisis, there's been so many learnings, uh, some positive, some negative. But uh, in general, you know, nothing is the same anymore, right? We're, we're questioning things. The government is involved in everything, telling us what to do, right? We want more things from politicians. We're asking for more purpose. The millennials, the generation Y, is asking why, right? Why do we do this? Can we trust them? And basically, it's kind of like a giant reset button. You know, and, and I think we're entering a truly chaotic decade of the next 10 years, but also a potential golden era, you know, to where we're finally saying, you know what, that isn't enough. When we don't want to go back to before COVID because it wasn't good enough, right? And we weren't actually doing a lot of things right before COVID. And now we learned, for example, that without collaboration, we are just going to time out, right? <laughs> and, you know, if we hadn't collaborated with COVID, we would never have the vaccine. And now we have to collaborate to actually bring it to everybody and to have the will for a common agenda, right? We're all going to be well or healthy or not, right? So that's what we've learned there. We've also learned how important other humans are. You know, we love the cyberspace, we love Zoom, we love hanging out, but in the end, you know, one hug does away with a thousand Zoom calls, right? Uh, and that is because we're not machines. And people are realizing that all of the really great stuff, the metaverse and, you know, doing virtual things, that's really great for work, for business, commerce, right? But is it good for humans? And now we're realizing, you know, how important it is to have real-life contact. And that we can't just take that off the agenda, even if it causes CO2 flying around in meeting, right? This is something that we do, right? And climate change clearly has moved on top of the agenda now because we don't want another major disaster uh, to actually prevail and take over that we had with COVID, right? So a little bit more foresight is being enforced. And people are saying, you know, now that we, we made different rules and we made compromises in COVID, can we make the same compromises for climate change? And can we change the agenda? And the answer is yes, because we've learned if we don't change the agenda, we're first going to have many, many, many people suffer and dying while we learn the lesson, right? And with climate change, we're talking about 500 million people, right? We're not talking about 20, 30 million like COVID eventually. We're talking about 500 and up. So I think that is the urgency is just so much more and also causing people to question politicians. Like, see all the populists around the world, they're going to be voted down and on the way out. Even Bolsonaro is on the way out. <laughs> and of course, the huge title shift in America. That would have never happened without COVID. We would have Donald Trump as a president if it hadn't been for COVID. Uh, and so, yeah. I was going to say, there's this fantastic meme, a uh, visual meme floating around the internet, and it was about, you know, the waves of change that will be impacting us uh, as as humans. And the illustration, I'm sure you've come across it, is is that the first wave of disruption or change was COVID-19. A bigger wave, an even bigger wave than the health wave, was the economic disruption coming soon thereafter. And of course, the next even bigger wave on top of that is is climate change. And there's, of course, the people on, on the shore, you know, just washing their hands in, in sanitizer and just say, hey, if you just sanitize your hands, you'll be fine. And of course, uh, the, the story is a bit more complex. Yeah, it's all hanging together, right? We will not solve climate change unless we solve capitalism, right? Because the business of doing not so good things is making a lot of money. So you have shares in Aramco, or on the digital pollution side, you may have shares in Facebook. You make lots of money in Facebook shares, not last week, but before, right? And basically, you can make a lot of good money doing pretty bad things. And that is the nature of extreme capitalism. In other words, uh, it's not good to do, but it makes money and it makes jobs, right? So straight ahead, right? Genetic engineering, brain uploading, cryonics, and so on. It just, you know, metaverse, it'll make lots of money, but, but people will suffer from it. So unless we fix the underlying logic, which is to say that profit and growth beats anything else, we're not going to solve climate change. Right? We're just not, because the motivation is missing. Yeah, you've alluded to the idea of profit there and, and the fact that capitalism might, might be 
be broken. What what other what other new P's that are emerging beyond just just profit in terms of what we should be thinking about? Is it the three P's from John Elkington's idea of people, profit, and planet, or are there other things we should be should be considering as we redesign the system? Well, I think first we have to say that capitalism is essentially unfit for this future, right? Because this future has to think beyond GDP and growth and personal gains. And that was kind of okay until now because there was so much room, you know? We were exploiting the earth everywhere and it didn't, you know, we noticed, but it wasn't failing. And now we're failing, we're looking at system collapse now, right? Ecological, financial, social, human, right? Uh, that's because we've gone to the top of the ceiling, right? So that kind of capitalism is timing out. And as Al Gore said, you know, 15 years ago, it needs to be a sustainable way of capitalism. I think we cannot go into the future and say that we won't grow because growing is human, you know? So a degrowth agenda, you know, I, I don't believe it's realistic. You know? But a different kind of growth, a sustainable growth and giving back and paying what it costs, right? So I've enlarged the story of John Elkerton, and I've, I've called it People, Planet, Purpose, and Prosperity. I like prosperity better than profit. You know? That's a Star Trek variation, basically. Right? So People, Planet, Purpose, which means why are we doing this? Right? And this is the question I ask of all of my clients, every tech company I work for, what is the purpose of you doing this? Is the purpose monetization? That's always going to be in there, right? Or is there other purpose, creating some sort of well-being right? and creating you know, a positive benefit around? And I think we need to redo the stock markets to uh, basically judge every company on those four points and only pay dividends if you tick all four boxes. Right? Um, and that is already happening. So we have the long-term stock exchange in San Francisco. We have other uh, exchanges looking at the model because everything else will lead us to a point of system collapse. Um, and then we're you know, looking at ancient Rome and other empires that collapse in a very similar way. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, the, the present model, and I think, I think it has started to shift, particularly during the pandemic, where we've really seen that sustainability has gone mainstream and we're seeing you know, the exponential rise of the B Corp movement. We're seeing the likes of BlackRock and Larry Fink and, you know, activist investors like engine number eight for example you know taking you know a large number of seats on the exxon board for example and, and displacing climate skeptics etc it does feel like there's this groundswell movements you know beginning to happen right now um, where we are redefining and where it's not just about profit maximization anymore are you seeing any other sort of evidence for, for a shift in, in mindset or, or zeitgeist? I see a lot of it everywhere, you know, but uh, to be frank, of course, the, the ultimate problem is that when you run a business, uh, let's say you run a bank or let's say you run the World Bank, right? It is not your job to fix the world, right? <laughs> it's like we can't expect the World Bank to solve our social and cultural and human problems. You know, the job of the World Bank is to balance money, yeah, and the job of the CEO isn't primarily to do good, prevent success, right, uh, in, in regular uh, capitalism, right? So we can't rely on just business to fix this problem. It's kind of like saying, uh, you know, you're going to stop eating meat and then you tell the cow to, to give you the message that meat is bad, you know? It's like, no, it's, this, this is not how it works. Uh, I think ultimately people have to ask for it. Uh, governments have to change, regulation has to be put in place. Uh, it's like anything that's really powerful, like technology or like oil and gas, right? Uh, we'll have to really start uh, putting provisions in place to change their ship around, and this will not be done voluntarily. This is why they have the whole debate about Davos and the World Economic Forum, right? In many ways, Davos does great work and the World Economic Forum. In other ways, it's a part of the problem, right? <laughs> In, in that way, it's kind of like Spotify. You know, Spotify is doing great things, but it's part of the music industry problem of not paying artists enough, right? Same thing, even though Spotify probably has less of a, uh, of a uh, issue with that. But in any case, so this is the problem. I think ultimately it's about government, people, policy, and sort of, uh, what can I say, a movement, right? And if you look what happened in the past, like Gandhi said, you know, 5% of the people 
going on the street, doing stuff with a particular problem, that's enough to change everything. So when we have 5% of people speaking out about wanting a different world, as we're starting to see, then everything is going to be a domino effect from there. Right? And the, the question that we really have to ask ourselves, you and me, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, but you know, what kind of future do we want our kids to have? Because you know, we'll see that future, but our kids will live in that future. Imagine you're going to live in the future 30 years from now, you know, when, when everything is collapsing. Yeah, not what I want my kids. Yeah. And of course, now we have, you know, a generation of, of, of men and women actually engaging in a baby boycott because there's so much pre-traumatic stress disorder, as the psychologists are starting to call it, that they are opting to remain childless. And in fact, the, the percentage is pretty high amongst 30 year old women, at least in Australia, who are now choosing mindfully not to have kids because they are so concerned about uh, climate crisis and what kind of world we're, we're, we're kind, you know, that we are becoming the stewards of. And, and, and that's, I mean, that is one very individualistic sort of response in terms of taking responsibility. But you're sort of taking, you know, one of the evolutionary gifts, I guess, away from, from, from yourself and, and taking responsibility for maybe what some of the polluting industries uh, have been doing for, for, uh, for decades and decades. The hopelessness problem, right, is this kind of despondency issue, right? Uh, and when, especially when you talk to kids today, anywhere between 15 and, and you know, 35 who <laughs> qualify as kids for me, right, that, that you would say, well, you know, most of them sound pretty darn hopeless. Even my own kids saying the world is going to be bad, right? Um, and I'm saying, like, it's not true. You know, the future is much, much better than we think. We have all the right cards. You know, all we have to do is change the way that we prioritize things and get on the same agenda, you know, on the most basic things, you know, uh, food, water, rights, uh, poverty, health, you know, those are all very basic things that, that even a warrior in Afghanistan would agree on that it's good to have food and family, right? So that's why I think the good future is such a, a strong theme because these days, you know, there's been a lot of research, uh, Pew Research just two weeks ago came out with this, you know, 90% of people ask, expect the future to be lousy, right? It's the lowest thing, lowest time ever, not just because of COVID, right? And we need to have a, another story that says, you know what, we actually have pretty much all it takes, and now we have to put the money in the right places and stop messing around with things that are outdated, you know? I mean, there's commentators and, and people in, you know, in our space as futurists, whether it's, you know, Peter Diamandis and, and the, this sort of abundance mindset and Steven Pinker and others who, 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 who keep saying, hey, that the future is a lot better uh, than we think it's going to be. Have, have you got any heartening stories or, or uh, data-based observations where you kind of go, hey, here, here's, here's proof or a good indicator that, you know, the future is is not just dystopia, but, but could be a, you know, a version of a utopia at least. The indicator clearly is what's happening in green energy and decarbonization. You know, we've worked on this for 50 years, really, and 20 years in sincerity, really, Club of Rome, a long time ago. And now, what's happening right now? Now people are saying, you know what? We have the tech. Solar is cheaper than coal. Right? And we are building nuclear fusion uh, power, right? We, we're working on all this. We have the tech, right? And now people are saying, you know, sustainable is the new profitable, profitable. And I always say green is the new digital, right? So in a very short time, the last three years, there's this fundamental shift of saying, yes, we can do this. Yes, we can have a benefit. Hundreds of millions of people will work in this new industry, the green industry, right? And yes, we can print the money and use it wisely, like we did with COVID, right? And I can guarantee you in 20 years, this problem is solved in the sense of, you know, up to two degrees warming will occur. But I think we can, we can limit it there. And then we can actually work to recreate a proper atmosphere, right? To take the CO2, we, we can solve this problem. And this is huge because basically the climate change problem to me is a problem that we are on the verge of solving, in the next 20 years. So yes, we're going to have to, you know, eat dirt for a little bit here uh, until we get to the point. But, but the solutions are right there. Unlike other things, you know, issues that we're facing like overbearing technology and, 
and that kind of thing. You know, this, uh, I mean, AI is really much more existential danger than, than climate change in the long run. You know, climate change is, and, and this is really the last two years we can say, you know what, this is actually being done now. Look at the German government, 85 billion euros per year is going to be spent on decarbonization. Right? Uh, and, and, and people around the world are making those decisions, whether it's New Zealand or uh, Germany or Iceland or even America, right? I mean, even America is going into a green boom. So we're, we're heading there. And you know, as to Diamantes and Pinker, you know, I, I, the big difference with me is that I don't believe technology is the key to this. Uh, technology is the tool for this, right? But we can do many things wrong with good technology. Like, you know, if we're going to end up in a surveillance state because we want to diminish CO2, that's hardly a very good trade-off, you know, so we're going to track everybody doing everything in return for losing uh, some, some CO2 output, yeah. Or as Yuval Harari would put it, if you give, you know, AI, a very sophisticated general AI, you know, the challenge of, you know, solve the climate crisis, the first thing that an AI might do, which is the, the easiest way of doing it, unless you give it parameters, is to just wipe out humanity because uh, then all other, all other, you know, systems might actually flourish. Um, so that's un unintended consequences. I've seen lots of positive proof of things, and, and you know, and, and also I, th I think the ultimate question, I think, as uh, Rutger Bregman puts it, uh, uh, is uh, is, the, is are humans in principle kind or not, right? And are we capable of doing this, or are we basically evil? If you assume that we're basically e evil, then it's game over. In twenty years, we're going to become machines, you know. Um, or if you believe that we are machines, of course, then it's also game over in the singularity. So to me, it's like I, I believe that people can do the right thing, that we are capable, that we are collaborative, that we are basically kind and erring a lot and you know, creating lots of chaos. But in principle, I think we can do it. Right? So that's just my outlook on what I think humans are. This this idea that you know green is is the new digital. Obviously, you know we've we've been playing in this space of digital transformation and digital disruption before that for for, for some time. Larry Fink, when he looks at the the next you know hundred or, or thousand unicorns, he believes that they will all be in the in the sustainability and, and green tech clean tech space. It won't be about you know creating another ad funded internet uh, company or a glorified classified but it is in the sustainability technologies. Uh, what types of technologies do you find most heartening? Is it, is it, you know, is it um, you know, farmers, you know, deploying regenerative farming? Is it in, is it in solar? Um, what, what are the types of technologies that you think really hold the keys for us being able to, to, to switch across to sustainable living? Yeah, I wish I could pull this up now. There was a great curve by Forrest, by Gardner the other day showing the hype curve and the, 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 uh, basically the climate, change, the climate technology curve, right? And it's all in the next 10 years. It's, like, it's, it's basically here, right? So there's a slew of things, right? For example, battery technology. You know, we're inventing battery technology that's not lithium-based, uh, that can do away with our current constraints, and then your electric car can go 2,000 miles without charging. Okay, hopefully not from coal energy to the church, but but <laughs> so and that's one of the clear things. And the other one is like preventing pollution and also making things more efficient. You know, we, we could basically save fifty percent of CO two by just making things more efficient, right? Uh, it, and that is a great argument, of course, for technology. Uh, we can make flying more efficient, right? We can make not flying also a good alternative by using virtual, of course, uh, unless we need that human contact there. Um, we can change agriculture, and we are, we're working on that right now. Vertical farming, right? Too expensive, but great solution. Uh, Lab-based meat, cultured meat from the lab, clearly very, very big deal for protein happening all around us. So there's, there's like 50 things, right? And they're all happening at the same time. This is why I'm such an optimist about uh, climate technology. Right? Basically, this is the number one problem. There are lots of solutions. We're going to get to the point where we can decarbonize by sucking the CO2 out. Way too expensive right now. Right? So if you have enough incentive, which is public pressure, right, the Gandhi moment, basically, right, and money shifting like it is right now, and a new business forming that promises the World Economic Forum says 360 million new jobs, 
in the next 20 years, right? You know, then I think you have all the makings of the, uh, yeah, the golden years, basically, right? The next iteration of the, of the digital revolution is the green revolution. Now, like the milestones have sort of shifted to a degree. I mean, at COP26, there were still, you know, 2050 and 2070 targets being put out there in terms of, um, in terms of balancing some of the climate effects. And, you know, so certainly some nations are trying to, to drag their feet a little bit more. But I'm curious as a, as a futurist, and we often get asked the question, you know, can you please help us with scenario planning for 2025 or 2030, 2035, 2050? What was your perspective on, on 2050 versus 2030? Is this just from people acting perspective? Is, is 2050 the right target or, or should, we, should we kind of not, – not just from the scientific perspective but also just from a sort of a future narrative perspective, is 2030 a, a better goalpost? I think 2030 is what really what I look at because that's the foreseeable future, as I call it. You know, where I can develop foresights on 2030, on 2050, the their variation is like, you know, 2030 is kind of like this, and 2050 is like, you know, forever uh, the possibilities. And and you know, I think 2050, however, is also a good date because it marks the date of the proposed singularity, which is the human-machine convergence when we are capable of spacefaring when we're capable of uh, becoming, you know, potentially living forever, parenthesis, right, uh, with technology. So that is an important date, you know. Um, I think the next 10 years are much more urgent to address uh, and to pay attention to, but having a sort of a dual uh, mindset of looking at the near future, which is now, basically, and then 2050 is probably a good idea uh, for scenario planning. Yeah, I mean, twenty thirty. I'm just thinking, even from a you know from a narrative perspective, I, I do think you know, as futurists, we sort of have the liberty to, to to think you know, in decades into the future. But I, w- I would say that you know, for for the for the common for the common man or, or woman, the lay person, you know, thinking about twenty fifty, I think it's it can be it's quite disenfranchising and 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 it can actually prevent people from from taking meaningful action. Have you got Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's so many variations about what it could be, you know, at a certain point. There's there's a lot of open-ended questions about what is going to be technically possible or which way we're going. In my view, it's a really uh, simple scenario. I think we're going to invent nuclear fusion. We're going to invent uh, a kind of longevity, not living forever, but we're going to invent human genome editing to avoid cancer. Uh, all these things are in the cards, and then what do we do with it? That is the key question, right? Uh, so it could be the Nirvana, potential Star Trek future, you know, where you know we all have access to it and we strive for other things than more money, uh, you know, or it could be, be potential hell, uh, in that only rich people would live in the metaverse and live forever, basically. Uh, and it, it, it could lead to a pretty bizarre Orwellian world. And that is not the question of technology. It's just the question of, you know, are we wise with technology? So I, I, as I often say, you know, we will have all the tools, but will we have the telos, you know, the Greek word for wisdom and for purpose and for understanding? And, and that's really what it comes down to um, because, you know, technology is morally neutral until we use it. Right? We can use AI to make a bomb, a, a digital bomb, right? or we can solve climate change with it. Right? So it's kind of like a nuclear weapon. And we're, we're clearly going to need more memorandums like we have with uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, as far as those powerful technologies go, like AGI, general intelligence, and, and human genome editing, uh, we're going to have to agree on what we want rather than what we can do. Right. That is going to be the, the key question. So, I mean, on a sort of planetary and global level, of course, we've got, you know, we've got the United Nations, we've got the WHO, we've got institutions that, you know, have led, you know, nuclear non-proliferation treaties, etc., and, and, and looked at, you know, some, some pretty pretty worrying, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction and all the rest. Do we need new institutions to, to look at some of the systemic risks associated with artificial intelligence or some of the systemic risks associated with, with climate change? Or can some of these old institutions 
be fit for the future? You know, I think they're doing a great job. I'm, I'm a great fan of what the UN is doing in many ways, also the European Commission and the World Economic Forum and the Millennium Project. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that work. You know, I think generally speaking, uh, I would like to see more like a council of the wise people um, that we had in ancient Greece. And it would be a council that doesn't have any, you know, authority in the sense of uh, the UN, uh, the Security Council. So, but just is very impactful in terms of what it turns out, you know, in, in terms of decision making and in terms of ideals and in terms of philosophy and stuff. And I think that's a little bit missing right now that we, you know, we have public intellectuals like Noam Chomsky and stuff, right, in, in the US. Right? But we, we need that on the global level, a council of the wise people, you know, um, that has no commercial affiliation or no, you know, World Economic Forum slant towards uh, grand, grandizing issues, right? Um, even though, again, don't get me wrong, I, I love their work. It's just, I think there is a side to it that may be suspect to some people in that process, right? So we need to uh, leverage a little bit more. I think we, we're not doing really enough for that discussion. You know, when, you, when you're speaking to people uh, on a general level, they speak about the dangers of COVID and the pandemic because that's here now. They know very little about what's happening in technology and AGI, very little what's happening with genetic engineering. Um, and most governments, you know, are clueless on these issues and uh, in the sense of being prepared. So I've been asking for a driver's license for government official, uh, a license for the future, you know, just to understand what the hell is going on. Because we're talking about the next 10 years, we're going to make decisions that will define if we die or live, basically, as a species. The next 10 years, right? Because, you know, once we have AGI, you're not going to unplug a computer with an intelligence of one billion with an IQ of one, but it's just not going to happen, right? Uh, and this is probably already in progress, this whole discussion with the military, right? So I think we need a lot more of that, and we're spending a lot of time on tech solutions, but we're not spending en enough money and time on human collaboration and solutions and philosophy and thinking and planning. So uh, I know Richard Branson was involved a number of years ago in, in a sort of a global council of, of the elders and I think maybe it was even called the elders I'm not sure what's happened with that uh, sort of initiative I think Nelson Mandela was it was it was a member and Desmond Tutu and, and of course some some of these have you know members have now passed um, but maybe we need a, a revival of, of, of that idea and a revival maybe of some of the Gr Greek Stoics to have a have a conversation yeah, I mean, we need something like Davos, but not in that commercial context, you know, something that is purely about these issues without any attachment to making money. Because the problem is that, I, you know that, of course, from our work, it corrupts the viewpoint when you're talking about money, right? Uh, and no matter how you do this, there's always some discussion about monetizing or the other, or, you know, and we're not freewheeling public intellectuals that... that derive money from a virtual dividend or something you know where you know we have all kinds of other things to do and so the the thing is in the end you know we need to look beyond at the very large issues and they need to be looked at in a way that the European Commission is doing a little bit of that right uh, but is being perceived as as basically just kind of putting the hamstrings and putting sand in the gearbox you know by most people which I think is utterly wrong because in the end you know, it's all about remaining human and increasing the quality of human life on a total level, you know, not on, on, on a 10% level that we live in, for example, you and me, we live on that 10% level, right? So, but it's about the larger story here. So this is going to be important. And I guess my, one of my concerns there as well is that maybe by only having the wise elders, we're also, again, disenfranchising the, the people who are going to live in that future, which is, of course... You know, Greta Thunberg and uh, and her and her peers, right? Who who will be around in twenty fifty and and twenty eighty, etc. And see see the the momentous consequences. That, that's true, but you know, everybody has their role in this, right? I mean, Greta is a is a catalyst. You know, to call her wise, I don't know. Maybe she has some wisdom of a of a sort. Like there are some young people, very young people, that have a kind of a wisdom, right? Um, but but of course that does come with age to some degree. So what I would think here is that putting all of that together in some way or the other, but it's great to be an accelerator. 
And if you're part of the Extinction Rebellion or so, maybe you have your own part in this, right? And everybody has their own part in this. But a council of the wise people is not a question of ethics or, or I mean, of, ethic, of ethnical background or age or sex, right? Um, and how would that come about? I, I don't know. It, I think it could be quite difficult, obviously. <laughs> right? Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it would help us a lot to get away from the sort of calcified thinking of institutions that we have right now. And people are saying, oh, the UN is utterly bureaucratic and the European Commission is like always trying to, you know, to, uh, to stronghold the American technology people and so on and so on. It's kind of the preconceived way. But in the end, none of that matters because if we can't, work together to create a future, there will be no future, right? And that is the only thing that matters. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the risk is, is, is the same for most of us, unless we've got a spot on uh, Bezos or Elon Musk's little shuttle to, to get to another planet, right? But you know, the story by Barbara Hubbard, right, who was a disciple of Buckminster Fuller, she said, uh, as you see the future, so you act, and as you act, so you become, right? So it is so important for you and me and for people in our field is, is to, to show a good future, right? To show a future that's functional, that's not dysfunctional, and not all the dystopia that we see on Netflix and Hulu and what have you, right? Because that isn't the future, that is the entertainment version of it, right? And, and to show the future that can be good is so important because when you believe that you can have a good future, you act differently. When you have a dark view, you act dark, and that creates dark things, you know. And especially for kids, that's just so important that we say, you know what? It's not hopeless. It's not that we can't do it. It's, there's a couple of things that we have to learn here, but generally speaking, we're actually very good at doing things once we understand them. I think that polarization really was encapsulated beautifully in in, in the recent movie. Don't Look Up uh, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio on on Netflix where you had this sort of, you know, American polarization of uh, people either going, don't look up or look up. And, um, you know, some people being aware of the threat. Other people wanted to mine, of course, uh, this big planetarian um, disaster that was on its way to 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 get minerals uh, you know in 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 the first instance to 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 maximize profits but i think it said a lot about of course as a as an allegory for the for the sort of climate change debacle that we we have in front of us at the moment as well some people trying to to profiteer from 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 these challenges and other other people actually taking longer term sustainable action well, when you know, when you look at the future stories, you really currently have two stories. One is the tech story that says, as long as you have more tech, you know, we're going to do great. And, and now we're going to move into the metaverse because we don't need a body and we don't need real people. We're going to live there, right? Okay, that's the tech story. And then IBM tells us about the programmable humans and, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, and, and then there's the other story, which is Hollywood and every major media organization, which is... The robots are coming, they'll take your work, and then they kill us for energy, okay? Uh, you have those two stories. And that is just completely idi idiotic, yeah? because it's not an either-or story. One is entertainment, the other one is tech industry selling tech stuff, right? And the reality is there's a lot more stuff that matters apart from entertainment and technology. You know, and our reality isn't driven by data streams and humans aren't machines. And, and so there has to be other stories. And this is why I think it's my job to tell a good future story and to tell about how it could be done. You know, once we uh, remove ourselves from this idiotic, egoist, egotistical equation. Yeah, well, I'm curious in your views on on the metaverse. Of course, it's a you know it's a it's a concept that's being you know touted all over. You know, one of my clients, formerly known as Facebook, has has just you know changed its name to 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 Meta. Um, the share market just the other week didn't love the uh, the merits of this metaverse. What do you think? Just on a, on a sort of human eth ethical level, is it is it you know, ethically defensible to to create and and double down on this type of virtual reality or mixed reality, whatever we want to call it, when we've got so many issues in, in IRL or in real life. I think first, you know, the metaverse is a very dim view of what humans are and what they want to be. You know, the idea that we're going to live in the virtual universe 
by wearing glasses or just wearing regular glasses or, you know, a hologram suit or whatever, and we're going to be happy there, right? I mean, that idea is ridiculous, right? Because how, how do humans become happy? Not because they're looking at a screen or, or because they're living inside of a computer, right? You can say that's a simulation of happiness, I understand, right? Maybe that's, that's their path, right? But my view is that humans are going to need a lot more than that. And so I say the metaverse could be amazing for business, including ours, you know, speaking, doing stuff. I, I see that as a great opportunity. It could be amazing for, for technology companies, of course, and for governments and for training and education, right? But it could also be detrimental to humans, right? In the sense of saying, you don't need to be real. You can be anything. You can fly... You can be a monster, you can be, you know, you can live forever, you can put your head in a petri dish and continue to exist. And, you know, all that kind of stuff basically says that humans are data, right? Algorithms are organisms and other way around, you know. Uh, and I think that is detrimental to the worldview. So, again, nothing wrong with the tech, except for, of course, the reality is that we don't have the tech. But right? <laughs> there's just no way that we could do what they want to do. Have you tried putting together a 3D fluid environment with avatars for more than 50 people, right? Like Second World has proven. That is just so intense on the processing. The CEO of Intel said the other day, we need a thousand times the computing power that we have today to realize the metaverse. Right? So that's one thing. The other thing is I think it's an aberration to think of that as the future of the internet or the future of how we live or it is just another tool and we should look at it as a tool and when we get too hung up on the tool like the mobile phone or so you know we get sick right? and look at instagram girls right sickness death suicide unhappiness and i fear that that the metaverse could be 500x of what we already have in social media, which is lying, distortion, manipulation, data mining, you know. And yet, I still use social media because I think there are some merits to it. Right? So on that point, we're sitting here at the beginning of 2022. Um, there are many things when we were in, uh, in Dallas in February 2020 that maybe were partly unthinkable that are now very thinkable. I'm curious what, what those things that maybe were unthinkable that are now thinkable. And then if you cast your mind into the future, just two years, uh, 2024, what are the things that are currently unthinkable that will be totally thinkable in, in, in a couple of years, Get Well, back then, you know, unthinkable was clearly like, uh, you know, using technology for all the things that we use it for now for. It was already like, I think Satya Nadeja, the CEO of Microsoft, said that there's been more digital transformation in the past two years than the previous 20 years. And, and so it was unthinkable that people would do these things, that they would actually go in a virtual space and they actually put on their headphones and their green screens. And, you know, and, and the transformation has to be fundamental. Buying stuff online. Uh, my, my 85-year-old neighbor is using uh, Uber Eats to order food now. Uh, you know, all of that was unthinkable, right? So that's all been good. And also unthinkable was that we would agree that we all have to get vaccinated. For the most part, we agree, right? <laughs> uh, and that we would do emergency things like wear masks and not leave the house and unthinkable, right? Going forward, unthinkable is the new normal. Right? And we have to get ready for this because the stuff that is being questioned now is fundamental, right? For example, we're going to see carbon taxes on flying with an airplane, mandatory, right? as we should, because we can finance the green shift from that, partly. We're going to see carbon taxes on eating meat, right? and we're going to eat other things than meat. We're going to, the future is vegetarian. I'm not vegetarian, but I see that clearly coming. And so unthinkable, yeah, I think we may even see a global carbon tax in all of the rich countries to finance the other countries not going further with their development of coal. Like, you know, we, we may see a 5% tax for all European countries to put into a pot that has been pointed out many times, you know, to pay India and Brazil and Indonesia not to do what we did. That would make a lot of sense and I'd be willing to pay it. Nobody wants taxes, but we're going to see those unthinkable things becoming very quick a reality uh, in trying to tackle our really top level problems. Yeah, and of course, you know, we already have taxes on things that are not 
necessarily good for us, like taxes on alcohol and taxes on tobacco, et cetera. And so um, it's not unthinkable that you also see that on a global trade level either, that, you know, products out of laggard countries that don't actually make meaningful climate uh, changes the products and services from those you know from those countries will also then have a a tax slapped on them so for example in future scenarios like this all you have to do is read uh, uh kim stanley robinson the ministry for the future right it's all in there and a lot of that is just already reality right so i mean in the end you know uh, no matter what we do in europe and the us and in most developed countries we have already caused two-thirds of the global pollution and climate change by ourselves. Okay, If we're going to get India and Brazil and China and Indonesia to not follow us, well, we can't just say, guys, you know, be responsible. No, we're going to have to pay them. Right? And where is that money coming from? Just like the vaccines, we're going to have to pay for others to get vaccinated. And I would be totally for that. Uh, because in the end, it's one world, right? We solve it together and... We pay for India not to make more coal plants would make perfect sense to me. Yeah. And I mean, you know, one of the excuses we often hear when it comes to, you know, nations or leaders, politicians not taking meaningful action on climate change is that we hear that, you know, they're, they're not abiding by the same commitments in India or in, in, in China, for example. And then, you know, I'll listen to that and in the news and then you know at the same time my son who who says he loves watching the news with me he'll say hey you know I, I should be able to stay up another 30 minutes and i say no no no, you should go to bed now because it's you know past your bedtime and he goes oh but such and such as mother you know doesn't have these rules and they don't abide by this uh, these kind of strict guidelines etc and you know as, as parents we don't abide by our kids trying to to throw out these excuses right but on a planetarian and, gl and global level you know, politicians are touting this idea that, you know, because of what they're doing over there, we shouldn't rise to the occasion and, and, and do the right thing. So I think we should expect a little bit more of, of humanity and hopefully some of the, the wise elders. Well, you know, the reality is no country, no matter where they are, can afford to run their own course and ignore everybody else's wishes on climate change or energy or, of course, nuclear weapons or, of course, uh, genetic engineering or AI, because these are global issues, right? And, and there's, there's no country, not even China. You know, China has to play ball eventually, <laughs> right? And it's, it's getting there. Uh, you know, it's clearly, if, if we have, we're moving towards a, a global world scenario, even a world government, maybe in 20 years or so, of a sort, you know? Um, where these issues are, are, and if you don't play along, you, your role is diminished in general, you know, and, and that is going to be the ticket going forward. So carrot and stick, right? The carrot could be lots of money for you to do renewable energy instead. And the stick would be that you know, you're not coming along for the ride if you're not actually enforcing it, right? Um, and I think that's where we're going. And it, it's not really new. It's just the proportions I Gigantic. I think McKinsey said uh, the shift towards decarbonization is roughly 150 trillion. And you know we've we've printed 30 trillion to deal with COVID. Can we print 150 trillion to deal with climate change? I think we can, but we don't necessarily have to print it. You know we can derive it from other resources. Uh, so I think that solution is near, uh, and it's going to require some real rule breaking. And also, you know, the, the challenge here again is that a politician. Imagine a politician would come forth and say, I'm proposing a, a carbon tax for flying on the airplane. And on top of that, it's going to be about meat eaters. And then you can't have a car. And the story goes on. Yeah, you know, how many votes would that person get? Right? So it's much better for a group of people to lay, lay out the, the land, right? And then the politicians can get behind it by saying, yeah, that seems like a plausible thing to do, right? And before you know it, it's the new normal. Like in Germany, you know, the the fairly green left agenda of climate change and progressive climate change action is has taken hold right it's and it's there good timing mm. so we're nearly into the uh you know 90th minute here in a soccer match plus a little bit of extension time i'm curious just the final question here garrett and thank you very much for for illuminating the path into the future what scares you the most 
now in 2022 and, and beyond? And equally, what excites you the most about our near or, or far horizon futures? Yeah, I think what scares me the most is that, that uh, we're still uh, in the next 10 years or next five years maybe in the hands of some very incapable people with some very, very big issues like the 3,000 nuclear weapons cruising around in America that are old and rusty and 50 years old, <laughs> and uh, you know, certain geopolitics that is run by old men who don't understand the future or the world. That scares me. <laughs> you know, and I, but I think that period is ending, uh, so I have reasonable belief that we can go through that and then move into a new future with young, female, and diverse leaders, as we're seeing, you know, and um, what excites me most about the future is clearly, I think, the combination of what I call awesome humans, you know, humans that, that are aware of things, that know things, that, that are creative, and on top of amazing technology. You know, that's to me is the ticket. You know, we, uh, and that gets me excited by saying, you know, we have amazing science and technology, let's add the awesome human people and create a global agenda. And I think then, you know, we should be looking at a very, good future roughly in, in 10 to 20 years uh, that is based on a lot more things than today, which is a very simple stock market equation of profit and growth. So I think that that makes me hopeful. Um, potential worst scenarios could be that we're not going to do that and that we're going to continue marching in the wrong direction and eventually kind of cease as a species uh, to be human and become machines. Mm. And of course, if we become machines or if we behave like robots or work like robots, eventually the robots will, will, will take those jobs and uh, maybe get all of their energy from, from, from us instead. Sounds very Matrix, right? <laughs> well, I think the likelihood of that is, is, is not very high, uh, especially because of COVID. You know, COVID was a giant trigger point of people looking for purpose. You can see that in the sort of quitting movement, you know. And now a lot of people are saying, you know what, I've had enough. I'm not going back to what I did before COVID. It wasn't good before and it isn't good now. <laughs> and, and I'm going to really change and look at things that are meaningful. And it's given a giant boost in this kind of reset moment. That's why I call this a new renaissance. You know, we realize that, you know, tech is so great, but in the end, it's going to be about what humans do, right? And it's going to be about human values. So I think in the future, in, in a total digital world, yeah, it, what's really going to differentiate us is how human we are, not how much we are like computers. Right? Because computers will then very easily say, you know what, you're never going to be like me because I'm much faster and quicker and smarter, right? We're just going to have to sit on top of them. That's kind of my future ticket. Yeah. Well, Gerd, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts on, on the second renaissance. Everything from the fact that green is, is the new digital to covering the emergence of, I guess, an evolution of John Elkington's three Ps with prosperity, people, planet and, and purpose. I think very importantly, almost the Japanese ikigai sort of concept of these overlapping concentric circles that we derive meaning from to, and of course, you know, painting a really, I think, heartening image of the good future and that gives us all hope. And I think that's something that we all need as we, you know, redesign our individual but also our collective futures for the future. So thank you very much for your for futurist thoughts here today. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to the show in your podcatcher and I'd be super grateful if you leave a review. For more information about the Second Renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersumanilson.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the Second Renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.